But what I want to talk about this morning is something that we don't often think about because surrender, total surrender to God is more than just uh, in our spirits or with our souls or in our relationships. Total surrender to God is also in something that I think sometimes we can find a wee bit difficult. And it's how do we learn to surrender our bodies, our physical bodies to God? Because it's something that the Bible talks about a lot, about the fact that God wants to work in and through our bodies. And so we need to surrender them fully and completely to him. But so many of us struggle with that. So I want to look this morning at a number of different scriptures, not everyone in the Bible that talks about our bodies, just a few. So I'm going to read a bunch of different scriptures. So if you have your Bible, you can turn. It's going to kind of be like the old, um, you know, uh, you know, Bible quiz, who can get to that verse the fastest. But uh, so if you have your Bibles, you want to follow along, great. If not, the verses will be up on the screen. But I'm going to ask, I don't normally do this, but I just feel uh, like it's important. Would you stand in honoring and the reading of God's word? And, um, and we're going to start here this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And there will be some group participation. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and what's the word? You guys are way better than first service. Spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ. God doesn't want to just sanctify your spirit. He doesn't want to just sanctify your soul. He wants to sanctify your body. Your body matters to God. And now on to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Whatever you eat or drink, your physical body, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And now on to Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul is saying your body, your physical body, when you surrender it to God, it has a spiritual application. We can't separate out spirit, soul, and body. We are spirit, soul, and body. We we are, it's all connected. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. Spirit, soul, and body. We are made in those three parts, but we can't separate them out. And then we go on in Colossians. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. And then on to Psalms. It says, for you, God, created my innermost being. You knit me together. You formed my body. You shaped me. You put me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because my body is fearfully and wonderfully made. If you've ever thought I'm just disgusted with my body, you are God's craftsmanship. God made you. You're perfect. You say, well, I've got sickness, I've got disease. We live in a world of sin, and because of sin, it has wreaked havoc on the created order. But God still made you wonderfully. And then on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do everything, but nothing will master me. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Your physical body, we can't even understand this, but your physical body is a member of Christ himself. Not just the body of Christ representing the church. Yes, it's that. But somehow in God's economy, when you come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, your body is now knit together into Christ's body. It's an incredible reality. He goes on. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who was given to you by God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Your body, God played at a huge price not just for your spirit, not just for your soul, but because he wants to redeem, resurrect, raise up your physical body. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. and God, we thank you for your word. It's timeless. And so I ask right now that you would speak to us, illumine our eyes, open our hearts, give us ears to hear. God, would you reveal truth to us this morning on what it means to surrender our bodies to you? And that when we leave here, 
we would say, surely God has spoken. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus, the strong son of God, we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. What we see here are some profound truths about how God views our bodies. God doesn't just say, I want to save your spirit. I want to save your soul. The Bible makes it very clear that when Jesus comes back, he is going to do what with our bodies? Resurrect them. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Um, God, will, we will be raised up. Our bodies will be resurrected. He didn't just say, I'm going to bring your spirit to heaven. He could have done that, but he says, no, I'm going to resurrect your body, your mortal body. We read in the scriptures, Job says, with my own flesh, I will see God. Paul writes about the fact that not all of us will die, but those who have died will be raised up. So there, our bodies matter to God. Now, here's the thing that's amazing. What we just read should fill us with awe. Our bodies, your body, whether you believe it or not, whether you look in the mirror and you're disgusted by your body, and we're going to talk about that, or you look at your mirror and you're proud of your body. Here's the thing. Your body is a sacred space. Your, your body is so sacred that God says, I not only want to work through your body, my spirit will dwell in your body. No longer dwelling God's presence in a temple made by hands, but dwelling in flesh and blood. We can't even understand what that means. It was such a foreign concept to the Jews. They said God's presence, God's spirit's in the temple. He's in the tabernacle. But the fact that God would make his dwelling in our bodies, that's mind-blowing. It is one of the most intimate aspects of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory, the God's spirit, the spirit of Christ, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is inside of me. That's powerful. Yet we so often overlook it. We look at our bodies and we have all kinds of thoughts and ideas. But it's our responsibility. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Honor God with your body. Worship him with your body. It means that we're called to care for our bodies. That we're called to, to make sure that we give them the, the proper things that they need. Why is that so important? Well, for three reasons. And we just touched on them. But let me reiterate. First is this, your body was designed by God, your body is joined to Christ, and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the Trinity in that? The Father formed you and shaped you. You are knitted now to Christ the Son, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost dwells in you. So God says, your body, your spirit, and your soul are important to me, every aspect of me. I care about you. I care about your body. Therefore, you need to care about your body. And yet so often we neglect our bodies. We don't look at them as something that, that we should uh, take care of. We don't look at the value that God places on them. But they're hugely important. So we need to, we need to care for your body. It means things like um, knowing what is, is helpful and beneficial to you, caring for yourself. When you can, where you can, caring for yourself the best that you can. I understand there are things that are out of our control. I, I understand that. Some of us have disorders. Some of us have disease. Some of us have sickness. Some of us have limitations. We have physical limitations. We have uh, those things that have afflicted us. And, and, and so those infirmities keep us from being able to do certain things. But where you can care for yourself, care for yourself. So if you have a food allergy and you say, I don't care about my food allergy, I'm going to eat what I want anyway because it doesn't matter. I know that uh, certain things aren't beneficial to fill my mind with, but I'm going to fill my mind with it anyway. I'm going to sleep around and be promiscuous even though the Bible tells me I shouldn't. I'm going to, um, to not exercise. I'm not going to get enough sleep. I'm going to do the things that I want to do. What you're telling God is this. My wants, my satisfaction, my desires are more important than your temple. God, what I want trumps you. 
God, what I think matters in my physical body, I need to eat, I need to eat a lot, I need to eat a lot of junk, I need to just uh, be a glutton. That's more important to me than your temple. And that is not total surrender to God. So we need to get to the point where we say, God, this is the body you've given me. Whether I like it or not, it is what it is. I know my limitations, I know my inabilities, but I am going to take care of my body because it is the body that you've given me and it's precious to you. You sent Jesus to die, not just for my spirit, not just for my soul, but for my body. So in other words, you and I, we need to be mindful of what fuels us. You need to be mindful of what fuels you. You need to be mindful of what's going into you. We're, we're, Chuck, you're a mechanic. If I, if I put diesel into a, a car that takes gasoline, what will happen to that engine? Nothing. It'll be good for it. It won't be good for it. It would, it would damage that engine. It would smoke a lot. So it's not preferred. It would be really bad. All right. So here's the point. Just because it's fuel doesn't mean it's good for the vehicle. Diesel and gasoline are both types of fuel. They're both petroleum-based. But if you put the wrong fuel in the wrong vehicle, it can not only damage the engine, it can potentially destroy the engine. And yet sometimes we say, hey, it's fine. It won't hurt me. But Paul said just because, it's a, just because you can do it doesn't mean it's beneficial. Don't allow those things into your life. Don't just take in and allow things into your life that are detrimental and hurtful because over time, it will become the thing that controls you. And it's not gonna be healthy for you. See, we live in a world where it's pretty easy to find someone or anyone who will proclaim very loudly with a megaphone on the social media platform that the things that God says are wrong are actually right. But that's nothing new. Paul was dealing with that. If you read that whole section from 1 Corinthians, the last uh, section that we read, it talks about uh, being joined with a prostitute and, and, and sexual immorality and on and on. And they're saying, it's fine, it's good, it's, it, it, you, I can do anything I want. He said, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. There's a lot of things you can do, but you need to care for your body. You need to watch what fuels you. I remember when my wife Jamie and I were first married, and it was glorious. I mean, I, I worked at a, a, a hotel. I was the front-end manager of the restaurant there. And, um, and one of the perks was I could pretty much eat what I wanted. Um, and in this this restaurant, this hotel was up in Vermont, and so the national mascots were Ben and Jerry, um, or the state mascots were Ben and Jerry, so um, we had Ben and Jerry, we serve it up, so I would almost every night, and I worked weird hours, a lot of times I worked nights, but we had room service, so I would have to stay to room service closed, so about like one in the morning, I would, I would do all the uh, clean up and check out, and then I'd get home about 2, 2.30 in the morning, and I'd bring home two big milkshakes, and a BLT on a bagel and a side of French fries. And we had a little a baby at home. And so I'd get home and I'd wake my wife up or she'd usually be awake and just put the baby down. So it's like three o'clock in the morning and there we are eating our BLTs, drinking our milkshakes, eating our French fries. And it was glorious. I mean, all through the fall, it was glorious. All through the winter, it was glorious. All through the spring, it was glorious. And then summer arrived. Now, in Vermont, summer's about six weeks long, and so it's about J July, and um, I take out my shorts, and I say, they shrunk. <laughs> I mean, I went up eight sizes in eight months. What meaneth thou this? See, you, 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 have to, you have to watch what fuels you. Now, by God's grace, I've, I've gotten back down to a reasonable size, um, but we, we can't just put stuff in because it feels good, it tastes good, it's what we want, it's what's going to satisfy our desires. We have to care for our bodies. We love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We love God, spirit, soul, and body. It means that we honor God holistically with our spirit, with our soul, and our body. So one of those things is that we have to uh, manage our physical health, right? Those things that we take in. 
our food, exercise, proper rest. We need to make sure that those things are important to us. It's one of the reasons I believe that fasting is a spiritual discipline because it's reminding us that our physical bodies won't control us, but that we can control them. But it also means maintaining sexual purity or integrity. And that's so important, and we miss that so often when it comes to our day and age. We have to decide as followers of Christ, will we live a life that reflects God's standard in our sexual lives or not? Regardless of your desires, listen to me. I don't know what your desires are. I'm not telling you, 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 I'm not telling you your desires are wrong. I'm telling you just because you desire something doesn't mean you can act on it. If you're a follower of Christ, you have one of three choices. One is to follow what God says in his word and at the expense of maybe having to deny some of your desires. The second is you ignore God's word and indulge your desires. Or the third, and probably the worst of all, is that you try and change God's word to accommodate your desires. But at some point you have to say, what am I going to do in my life to maintain sexual purity? It's one of those things that if you're a married couple, please, 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 for all that's good, right, and holy, learn to talk about your sex life. When my wife and I will do pre-marriage counseling and we'll meet with a couple and we'll usually spend at least one whole evening, sometimes multiple evenings, talking about sex and sexuality. And I don't blush. I don't embarrass easily. I'll talk about anything. So my wife sometimes will say, how could you say that? I said, well, it's biology. Um, But here's the thing, they will often, we've never heard this, nobody's ever told this to us. When we do marriage counseling sometimes with a different couple who's been married for 10 or 15 years, sometimes we'll have to bring up sex and sexuality and we'll tell the same things to them that we tell a couple before they're married and they'll look at us and say, we've never heard this. And I said, you've got kids. How could you never heard this? Because we don't talk, we don't communicate. So spouses, talk about your wants, your desires, the things that are comfortable, uncomfortable, your boundaries. Talk about those things. You have to communicate in order to maintain sexual purity. Otherwise, one or the other is going to be frustrated. There are couples who've been married for decades, and they're both frustrated in their sexual life because they won't talk. So you have to communicate. If you're single, Please hear me. Surround yourself with godly people who will help you put boundaries in place and bring accountability into your life. I can't imagine being single in this day and age when the quick one-night hookup is is like the the deal. I mean, it's it's the third date. Are we allowed to sleep together? So listen, you need people that are going to hold you accountable, that are going to help you maintain purity in your sex life. And as I talked about last week, listen, If it's from decades ago or from days ago, if you're walking in guilt, shame, and condemnation because of something you've done in your past, there's grace. There's grace. You go to God, you repent, you ask for forgiveness. And then by his grace, you leave the past in the past so you can step into his promises for your future. So if you didn't hear the service last week, the sermon last week, I encourage you to go online and listen to it. It will help you. So not only do you have to... uh, maintain sexual purity. You also have to, um, have to work really hard to manage your mental and emotional health. Listen, that means what goes in. What are you listening to? What are you looking at? What voices are you allowing into your life? What are you filling your mind with? Because what you fill your mind with will shape your emotions, and your emotional life is part of your physical body. So you might need Christian counseling, and if you need a Christian counselor, we can help you with that. But what you need to do is you need to fill your mind with God's word, God's truth, over and over and over again. You need to meditate on God's word. And listen, Christian meditation is powerful. Now, non-Christian meditation is this. Non-Christian meditation, Eastern meditation, secular meditation is the emptying or detaching of oneself from oneself so that you can connect to the universe. But that is not Christian. That's not, that's pagan. Christian meditation, and it talks about it throughout the Psalms, meditate on the word, sila, means to think about, meditate on. 
Christian meditation is the exact opposite. It is not the emptying of oneself, it's the filling of oneself. Filling yourself with God's spirit, filling yourself with his word, thinking on his word, considering his word, thinking on it over and over and over until you can connect to the truth of who God is, of what he says about you, about what he wants to do in your life. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you connect to that truth, you're connecting to the deeper part of who Jesus is. But meditate on his word. It also means working diligently. We've read that, right? Whatever you do, do it as under the Lord. So listen to me. If you work for someone, whether as an employee or you're a business owner and you work for a customer, you ought to be the best person there is. You ought to never be the guy who shows up late, who leaves early, who cuts out, takes an extra long lunch break, who stands at the uh, coffee pot or the water cooler and, and steals time for your employer. You ought not to fudge on your expense reports. If you tell a customer, this is what I'm going to do and this is the contract I sign, and then you realize I underestimated and they won't adjust the contract, you eat it. You ought to be the person that everyone says that's a man or a woman, a business owner, an employee of integrity. Listen, your employer, your manager may not like you because there's a personality conflict. Your manager may not like you because of who you are and the truth that you live for, but it, they ought not to be able to accuse you of being someone who is less than um, a hard worker, a diligent worker. I worked for years in corporate America, and I'll never forget one of the greatest compliments I've received in all my life. The last manager I worked for before I left and, and, and uh, went into uh, full-time pastoral ministry. When I came and told him, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my notice, um, he said, hey, that's great. I just want to tell you, you just made my life a whole lot easier. I said, because I'm leaving? He said, yeah. And I said, he said, because you've, you've only been in this department for a couple of years. Everyone else has been here for at least five or six years longer than you, but you're the guy who's earned the promotion. I, I was going to have to promote you over everybody else, and I... <laughs> He said, and now I don't have to. And then my very last day there, um, and actually I continued to, people would call me for about two months afterward, and even though I wasn't working there, getting paid, I still answered the phone call. But my very last day there, I'm sitting at my desk, and, and the manager walks in, and he looks, and we're in this kind of open airspace, and he said, should have known you'd still be the last one here. That ought to be the hallmark of who we are. And if you're a, an employer, listen, everyone ought to want to work for you. That everyone says they treat me fairly. They don't, they don't um, dock my pay when I haven't earned it. They give me a chance to, to correct things. Listen, sometimes you got to call someone and, and, and reprimand them. Sometimes you have to uh, write them up. I understand all those things. But everyone ought to say, you know what? That's a fair employer. Everyone wanted to be around Jesus. Everyone ought to work. Not that, like, oh, that guy, he's trying to squeeze every nickel out of me. Takes advantage. I work overtime. He refuses to pay. I put in extra time, she doesn't even thank me. We ought to work diligently. And the last thing is we ought to worship consistently. Sacrifice your body. Surrender your body, which is your act of spiritual worship. What is worship? Worship isn't just singing songs, though it is. It is. It includes singing songs. But worship is something you do all the time, day in and day out. If your worship is confined to an hour and a half on Sunday mornings and once a quarter at ignite, you've missed the point of worship. Do those things. But you know what? Worship means coming to God in prayer. It means praising him for who he is, for what he's done in your life every day, thanking God. It means pondering his word. It means telling people about his goodness. It means being an encourager, caring for others. It means using your body every day to do something that brings glory to God and help to others. That's worship. That's how you offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship. So why is it that we struggle with that? What is it that makes it so difficult? I believe it's because so many of us live at one of two extremes. And really, I think what it is, is rather than living at one or two extremes, we ping pong back and forth between them. But here it is. You either despise your body or you deify your body. Despise your body or deify your body. You either despise your body and you look at everything that you believe and can see that is wrong with you. 
Everything that you believe that isn't right. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too thin. I'm too not thin. I'm too old. I'm too wrinkly. I'm sick. I have this infirmity. There's something wrong with me. And I don't like it. And we despise our bodies. We say, God, you made me wrong. I know you say I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but there's nothing wonderful about me. And we despise our bodies. The other extreme is that we deify our bodies. My body, my choice. No one will tell me what to do with my body. Listen, that statement, no one will tell me what to do with my body, is so close to being right. But the closer to being right we are, the more wrong we can be. Yes, no one has a right to tell you what to do with your body except the one who made it. God and God alone has reserved the right to tell you, this is how I want you to behave sexually, physically, how I want you to use your body. God has that right. God has reserved that right. So we deify our bodies. We'll spend hours and hours and hours to get just the right physique so that everyone will say, oh, look at him. He almost looks like Matt Borders. Um, Listen, there's nothing wrong with exercising. But what's the point? Is it to bring glory to yourself or so that your body is fit and able to serve the way God asks you to? We'll spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to put tattoos here, 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 here. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with tattoos. But I think sometimes we ping pong between being despised and deifying. So we'll spend more money to to mark up our bodies than we will give back to God because we're so disgusted with our bodies that we want to do something to make us feel good about ourselves. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with tattoos. I'm asking you what's your heart and motivation behind getting the tattoo. Some of us will spend ourselves into debt to have the perfect wardrobe. Please don't show up naked, okay? (laughs) Nothing wrong with clothes, but what is it? Who are you trying to impress? Why did I wear this suit today? Some of us will, will just spend a fortune getting our hair done, our nails, our makeup, getting everything just right. We deify our bodies. But again, sometimes it's because we ping pong back and forth. I'm so disgusted by myself. Somehow this will make me feel better about myself. And yet neither of them work, and it leaves us wanting because God doesn't either want us to deify our bodies or despise our bodies. God wants us to use our bodies to honor him, to sacrifice our bodies. God says, honor me with your body. So that's what God wants from us. Don't deify it. Don't despise it. Use it for my good. Use it to glorify me. Use it to help others. I understand we have limitations, I don't need to tell you what your limitations are and you don't need to tell me. We all have them. Listen, I will never play basketball like Michael Jordan. I will never sing like Chad Sterling. I will will never be able to do certain things. I know I have limitations. I understand that. No one's ever signing me up to be a model. We all have our limits. But what happens is we use our limits Okay, I have a physical ailment. I don't have the physique I want. I have a sickness. I have a disorder. I have something that's holding me back, and we use that as an excuse not to use our bodies in service to God, to not sacrifice, because we say, there's something wrong with me, and God says, I can use you. Stop making it about what you see on the outside and be willing to surrender your body to me. David Ireland uh, was diagnosed uh, with a neurological disorder. And he would eventually die from it. Before his death, he wrote a book, Letters to an Unborn Child. And in that book, he makes this statement. He says, I am firmly convinced that God is extremely good and that he does love and understand all the world and all the people in it. Will he heal me? And then he kind of leaves this question. Does it even matter? Does it really matter? Is that the issue? Is it what God does to my physical body that is the issue in God's goodness? He says, no, my faith is in the goodness of God, not whether or not he will do this or that to demonstrate his goodness. 
You may have limitations, okay, but that doesn't mean God can't still do good things in and through you. You are a dwelling, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and God doesn't want to just dwell in you. He wants to work through you. So what we need to remember is this. The goodness of God is not based on something good happening in my life. The goodness of God is based on his nature, which is good. We sang the song, The Goodness of God. God isn't good because he gives you what you want. God isn't good because he makes you taller. God isn't good because he he makes the weight fall off of you. God isn't good because he healed you. Those things happen, praise God. But if those things don't happen, God is still good. If you don't understand that, then you'll spend your life saying, I guess God isn't good because he didn't give me what I wanted. But that doesn't worship the nature and character of God. Once you're fixed on the goodness of God, because that's his nature, then it's much easier to surrender your body as a living sacrifice, as a spiritual act of worship, because you say, even if I don't have the good thing that I want, God is still good, so I can worship him. Almost everyone God ever used had issues in their body. Moses stuttered. Sarah was old. Uh, Elijah was depressed. Hannah wrestled with infertility. Jacob limped. You can go on and on. Um, Timothy had a stomach ailment. Paul was going blind. Mary was promiscuous. I mean, you, you can look at people throughout the Bible and you could say they had physical issues. They had limitations. They had infirmities, but God used them. Why? Because God is good. But you have to be willing to surrender your body and sacrifice to say, God, Even when things in my body aren't good, you're good. And because you're good, I will worship you. I will honor you. I will use my body for your honor, for your glory, not my own. I won't deify my body, but neither will I despise it. So here's what you need to do. And I would encourage you to write this down somewhere, put it on a card, write it somewhere, and you're going to see it every day, and it's going to irritate the fire out of you. You'll be like that stupid pastor. I don't want to see this anymore. But as long as it irritates you, it means it's still getting into you. So let it get into you until it gets to the point where it doesn't bother you anymore because now it's not an outside truth that's rubbing against you. It's an internal truth that comes alive in you. But write it down. Repeat it every day. Some of you are going to repeat this thing for months or for years. I don't care. Be mad at me because it's the truth of God's word. So here it is. Write this down. I will honor God with my body. Everyone say, I will. I will honor God with my body. It's the gift that he's given me. Jesus paid a price for my body so that he could raise it up. So I will honor God with my body. What does that mean? It means I will not yell at my spouse. I will not hit my children. I will not lie to my partner. I will not steal from my business. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to get high. I'm not going to get stoned. I'm not going to look at porn. I will honor God with my body. I'm not going to be that person who cuts corners. I'm not going to be that person who says things that are hurtful and demeaning. I will honor God with my body. What does that mean? It means, God, I will honor you with my eyes. So the things I look at, the things I take in, will build me up. I will honor you with my ears. So the things I listen to and the voices that speak into my life will help me to become the person you've called me to be. I will honor you with my hands. I will serve and not take. I will honor you with my mouth so that I can be an encouragement. I can tell of your goodness and I can speak of your love. I will not be somebody who is Uh, mean or hurtful or crass and unkind. God, I will use my mind to imagine great things that I can do to think about your goodness and to dwell on your love rather than using my mind to be full of jealousy, frustration, disappointment, or hate. Because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, Even, 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 even if I surrender my body, but I don't have love, I've accomplished nothing. If you're surrendering your body to God, but it's not helping you, changing you to use your body in service, in love, in kindness, in grace, in compassion to other people, you haven't really surrendered your body. You're holding on to it. So here's my challenge to you. See, we don't need a bunch of rules. We need 
Somebody asked Jesus, what's the most important rule? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. They're the same rule. And when it comes to surrendering your body, it's just an extension of that rule. That when I surrender my body, it helps me to live the way God desires me to live and to be the person that Jesus wants me to be. It helps me to become like him. So ask yourself, Will I stop thinking about all the ways I'm disgusted, I despise, I don't like my body? Will I stop thinking about how smart I am, how strong I am, how good looking I am, how this I am? Will I stop deifying my body and instead start looking at ways I can honor God with my body? It's the only body you've been given and God wants you to use it until you breathe your last. And then he's going to raise you up. And all of a sudden, you're going to be given a body without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, without sickness, without sin, without disease. And it will be a glorious reality. But until then, honor God with your body.